Hello, my name is Kent Wong. I'm the director of the UCLA Labor Center, and I'd like to welcome you to week three of our UCLA course on nonviolence and social movements with Reverend James Lawson, Jr. And uh, we wanted to encourage all of you who are joining us, especially from different parts of the country to share this and to encourage others to join us on a weekly basis. We are very honored today to have my friend, Professor Melina Abdullah, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, join us. And um, I wanted to start the conversation because Reverend Lawson felt very strongly about having a conversation focused on the movement for Black Lives. And he has referred to the Black Lives Matter movement as the first major nonviolent protest of the 21st century. So I wanted to first ask Reverend Lawson, what do you mean by that when you say that you consider Black Lives Matter as the first major nonviolent protest of the 21st century? <laughs> uh, Kent, and, and welcome uh, Melina to this class at uh, UCLA. Um, Well, Black Lives Matter struggle <clears throat> uh, is a struggle that comes out of the evolution, evolutionary approach that Black people have taken in the 20th century to challenging uh, Jim Crow law, segregation and racism, and the torture through which they have put many of our people, many Black people, um, there's a no accounting for the loss of life in the black community in the last uh, hundred years, for an example, at all out of the systemic uh, racism that our society has adopted. And while it's been worse in places like southeastern part of our country, it is a national and has been always a national issue, a national social issue. Uh, first of all, uh, out, of the out of the 20th century, the movement between three months, uh, May and September, May and August, there were more than 5,000 demonstrations um, in all 50 states, including uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, they involved, according to the scholarly estimates, anywhere between 15 to 25 million people, which makes it very large. And they've been largely nonviolent. Um, the media continues to talk up the violence. I recently, just this year, heard Senator Ron uh, Johnson out of Wisconsin, um, who I think uh, is a man that does not recognize his own prestigious posture, because he's one of 500 legislators in the United States of America for 330 million people. Uh, an enormous responsibility for him to declare that BLM is a violent group and that if it had been B BLM Ju uh, January 6, 2021 in the Capitol building, he'd have been very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. he, he demonstrated his a deep, <clears throat> deeply nuanced racism in making that kind of a statement. Uh, but scholarly studies of BLM has indicated uh, that they have been from 97% to 95% effectively nonviolent. Most of the violence has come from the police. This is according to a, a large number of op-eds by scholars of one kind or another, but especially the scholarly group out of Harvard University uh, that uh, very dear friend of mine, Erica 
Chenoweth uh, 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 is a part of. She is one of the first scholars um, to ever begin the study of a violent and nonviolent social change <laughs> um, across the world and continues to be a major scholar in that field. Um, so BLM has been highly effective and they've started this effectiveness in less than, they've organized this effectiveness in less than one decade, which is one of the uh, startling things that I see that's very important. In less than a decade, they have put the idea, the, the issue rather of uh, police violence and, and police not being a democratic force for justice in our society on the agenda. And we could not do that in the 20th century um, because we knew the police violence, but we had a much larger task. So in any case, uh, um, Black Lives Matter uh, is, uh, in fact, a large uh, effective campaign. Now, its effectiveness cannot be finally gauged because that's still going on. Right. But, but a number of states have begun to address the issue of police violence in local communities. State of New York, for example, passed an act last year that said by the end of 2021, December 2021, every community in New York that has a police force must offer a plan to the state that indicates how they're making police. I'm going to say it this way, how the police have to become in a democratic society more nonviolent. <laughs> more reflective of the issues of uh, economic, social justice, equality, less male chauvinistic, uh, far less uh, use of violence in, in ways that, that we don't need it practice in a democracy. I would lift up here one item that it makes how important this is. Police, the United States has never had a general conversation on the role of police in a democratic society. We have been inundated, however, with the romanticism of violence out of particularly the books and the movies on Western lore. Uh, but a, a major factor has been left, left out of the, our reporting of Wild Bill Hickok or Bat Mattis, Matheson or Wyatt Earp and his brothers. And that is this, that in most of the cities where those people were lawmen in the last half of the 19th century into the early part of the 20th century, they had city councils and mayors and business community and religious groups and civic groups limit where the gun could be carried. So for an example, a Dodge City or Wichita, Kansas, those organizations inside those cities insisted that a gun could not be carried inside their city limits, period. So early gun control in the United States began uh, in the 19th century uh, where law people, people who were appointed locally as marshals and peace marshals and so forth, uh, caused the community to understand that it's gonna stop the wildness of guns on Saturday night or Friday night or anytime during the week. Uh, it would have to be stopped by having a prohibition on guns in the city limits of a tombstone, as an example, a tombstone, Arizona. 
So Black Lives Matter has effectively pushed this nation as never before in taking a look at how you help to enforce justice and equality and liberty uh, um, without the horrendous uh, violence against um, mostly black people, black men in particular, uh, but also uh, brown people as well. So uh, I think uh, I've been continuing to read on the Black Lives Matter uh, campaign, which I hope is going to go into the 21st century as well in many ways, because nonviolent struggles are the only way you can effectively change injustice in the United States or elsewhere. The only way you can change oppression. So in having Professor Abdullah here, we are also acknowledging our debt to the uh, Black Lives Matter in continuing the change that our nation desperately needs. Thank you, Reverend Lawson, for uh, those uh, opening remarks. Um, we are so uh, pleased to have with us uh, Professor Melina Abdullah, who has been a leader in uh, the university as a scholar, as a teacher, but also as an activist. Uh, she has been a leader within the Pan-African Studies at California State University and has been a co-founder of the Los Angeles chapter of Black Lives Matter. Uh, the last time the three of us gathered in person was actually at a press conference uh, on the eve of the teacher strike here in Los Angeles in January 2019. But I hope the three of us will be able to gather in person again uh, in the near future. But uh, welcome, Professor Abdullah, and thank you so much for joining us. And uh, the question uh, really is about the origins of the uh, movement for Black Lives and the significance of this movement being founded by three Black women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi. Yes, well, thank you for having me, Kenton. It's really an honor to be with you all. And, you know, we've been struggling alongside one another, you and I, Kent, for many years. Um, and both of us owe so much to the teachings and example of Reverend Lawson. Um, and I really have been contemplating a lot uh, around this question of nonviolence and um, around how it seems systems and institutions try to spin what it means to engage in nonviolent direct action, which is what Reverend Lawson has taught us, right? It, it doesn't mean accept the world as it is. It means that you use nonviolence actually as a tool to confront oppression. That's that's the philosophy that we come from. We're trying to build a more peaceful world and we use nonviolence as a tool, but we don't accept violence as um, our kind of embrace of nonviolence. It's really about the nonviolence and the direct action coupled with one another. And I think that's really, um, that really gets into the question that you're asking Kent about um, the origins of Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter was, um, found it not simply as a response to the violence that is levied upon the backs of Black people, right? So we know that there was a spark. And on July 13th, 2013, everyone remembers that that was the day that George Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin. Um, there was an immediate, immediate emotional and spiritual response. I said, I, I always call it my sacred duty, um, a sense of urgency, a sense of calling that pulled me as a Black mother into the streets, right? And in Los Angeles, the streets erupted, um, much like the streets all around the country. And before there were blue gates around Lamarck Park, we knew that that was the gathering place anytime we felt enraged or also anytime we felt elated, right? We gather in Lamert Park as black people. And so um, I remember getting the call about 
um, Zimmerman being acquitted. And if folks remember following the trial and it feels like you know, history is in a way repeating itself as we follow the Derek Chauvin trial, right? Um, we were following the George Zimmerman trial and expecting to get some semblance of justice, right? Because it wasn't because Trayvon Martin was the first black boy to be killed by white supremacy and um, be have that murder be supported by the state. I think there was a lot that went into it that George Zimmerman wasn't really a cop, right? He was a neighborhood watchman in his own mind, right? He also wasn't really white. He was, his mother is Peruvian, right? And so we thought that some of the privileges afforded to white supremacy, afforded to state violence, wouldn't be um, owned by George Zimmerman. And I think many of us thought that he would be convicted. And I remember that it was a weekend and I needed to do errands. I'm a single mom of three kids. It looks like the verdict wasn't coming out and all the commentators were saying, oh, it's not gonna come out till Monday. So I went to run errands and as I walked into CarMax, I was buying a used car because my family had grown. Um, I got a call from my brother who said, where are you at? And I told him and he said, well, sit down because you're not gonna like it. And he said, he got off and they're giving him his gun back. And I remember this fog overtake me and later I would feel connected to Joanne Robinson because there's a story about her hearing about the arrest of Rosa Parks and she was also doing work for her family. She was grocery shopping when she heard. And as black mothers, we still have to take care of our children. So I remember hurrying my children out of the CarMax and getting back home and cooking dinner and feeding them and still bathing them and calling three other black mamas. And we sat on my couch and we knew immediately where to go. So we pour out into Lamert Park. There's already thousands of people there. And um, I remember um, a young black woman and I had been talking with her. She was 19 years old. This was her first demonstration. She said, I don't wanna be in this park. And I said, well, what you wanna do? And she said, I wanna march. And I remember we were in the park and there was questioning. There were some other people who'd been in organizing space before. And some folks wanted to march south and Lamar Park sits right on Crenshaw Boulevard, right? And we wanted to march south down Crenshaw. And I remember thinking that's a terrible idea because nobody cares what happens when you march south down Crenshaw, it gets blacker and poorer the further south you go. But if you march north, they're concerned about what happens as these crowds of black folks march into whiter and more affluent areas, Crenshaw North dead ends into Wilshire Boulevard, right? And so I remember getting on the bullhorn, I always tell my activist students, the first investment that you make is in a bullhorn, right? And yelling in the bullhorn, go north. And we all marched north. And for three days, we actually, that was one of the first principles of Black Lives Matter, that we disrupt spaces of white affluence and we build and protect Black community, right? So that was one of our first principles. And so we did that for three days. We disrupted and as we talk about nonviolence, we need to remember that disruption is nonviolence, right? Disruption doesn't mean that we're being violent. It means that we're being heard. We're demanding that we be heard, right? It's a direct action. And so we marched north. We um, shut down the exposition line. It was a new train line. We wound up marching to Hollywood and Highland, the tourist center. We marched on the third day and shut down the 10 freeway, which was the first freeway shutdown of the Black Lives Matter era. And in a conversation actually with John Lewis as he came to visit Black Lives Matter um, organizers in Los Angeles, one of the things that he said is that he thought that freeway shutdown in many ways um, mirrored what ha happened on Edmund Pettus Bridge. And he reminded us that you know when they were marching, traffic had to stop then too, right? And so I thought that that was really encouraging. And so that's one thing that I also have to, 
thank Reverend Lawson for is always encouraging us, right, to, to stand up against injustice. And so we built Black Lives Matter. On the third day of protest, I received a text message that originated with Patrice Cullors, one of our co-founders. And um, she asked for us to meet at her Black artist community, the Black artist community that she lived in then, called St. Elmo Village. And I always um, remember feeling like the text was a top secret text from our version of the Underground Railroad. It said, meet at 9 p.m. at St. Elmo Village. And by then I was in the streets, not only with the other black moms, but I also called my students. And this is the importance of ethnic studies and black studies that were also um, a discipline or set of disciplines that's committed to social justice work on the ground, not just concepts in the classroom, right? And so my students were there, I passed along the message to my students and we met in this beautiful black artist community. And under the light of the moon, we pledged to build a movement, not a moment. I didn't yet know Alicia Garza and Opal Tometi, but I'd been in community with Patrice Cullors for a few years by that point. And you know, what we recognized is that it was Trayvon Martin's life that was stolen, but it was also Oscar Grant's life that was stolen. And it was also Margaret Mitchell's life that was stolen and Sean Bell's life and Amadou Diallo's life. And so we have to build a movement that upends unjust systems and ushers in new ones. And so Black Lives Matter was built on that principle of um, nonviolent direct action, uh, womanist leadership that says that we have to enter the movement as our whole and complete selves, um, that also says that we have the power to not just reform systems, but to transform systems. And so that was the birth of Black Lives Matter right here in Los Angeles. Um, and we're very grateful for all of those um, who struggled before us because it was really, you know, on the shoulders of all of those freedom fighters, including Reverend Lawson, um, that we were able to vision this iteration of Black freedom struggle. Thank you, Professor Abdullah, for that eloquent um, capture of the launch of Black Lives Matter, for lifting up the memory and legacy of Trayvon Martin and to centering it to what is happening now and today uh, when the trial of the killer of George Floyd mm. is going on as we speak, when yet another killing, police killing of a black man in Minneapolis has once again uh, been on the front page of newspapers across the country. Uh, we see this continuing pattern uh, that directly emanates from white supremacy and from the legacy of racism within our country. And I wanted to um, call upon uh, Reverend Lawson to reflect. I know that um, Professor Abdullah referenced, John Lewis referenced uh, comparisons to the uh, uh, movements of decades past, but um, Reverend Lawson, if you might reflect on how you see uh, similarities or differences between some of the movements that you were directly involved in in the South with regard to the lunch counter sit-ins, the freedom rides, the um, uh, campaigns against Jim Crow and segregation in the South, and what we see today with the movement for Black Lives. Well, I'm not sure I see that many differences. Black Lives Matter is intergenerational. Um, Professor Abdullah said that uh, organized by black women. That's a legitimate approach, it seems to me, very much so. Um, a large part of direct action in the South had women leaders and speakers and uh, uh, people like uh, Joanne Robinson, but also Septima Clark, yeah, Annie Carr, a great, a great, great, great range of women. Um, there is a certain amount of notoriety in male clergy because of our role, but that wasn't established by our movement at all. It was more established by the press. 
um, uh, I recruited John Lewis for the struggle to desegregate downtown Nashville. He was recruited by one of our key people, Kelly Miller Smith, who was his professor at ABC. We set out that summer of 1959 to recruit young people because they represent idealism. They represent a sort of freedom that many parents and adults did not have. They represented also a high level of idealism that was critical. So in actual fact, many of the books about the sit-in campaign are quite wrong because in, Nash in Nashville, at least, we recruited deliberately from the student bodies and from students that we knew. And of course, they proved to be outstanding people in, the, in their commitment to the ideals of desegregating deracializing um, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, which became a plan in more than 200 cities across southeastern part of the country, uh, uh, following the notion of nonviolent action and direct action. So I, th I think in that sense, um, BLM is more within the tradition of the action prone efforts of the 20th century um, uh, then, then they are different from, um, I would almost say that the fact that, that black women founded their network, that would be the use, most unique thing about it, about Black Lives Matter in comparison to the 20th century. And, and that's perfectly, justified in my own mind because the uh, movement in the 20th century has always been um, um, men and women, young people and older people, even, even children. So, and, and it, I think that's a good example uh, for the continuation of, of the campaign towards justice in the United States. Thank you. Professor Abdullah, could you describe the structure of the Black Lives Movement and how the movement maintains focus and discipline? Sure, so that's a really big question. So in terms of structure, there's Black Lives Matter as a global network, um, which is an assembly of chapters throughout the globe, right? So there's there are chapters in the United States. We also have chapters in the UK. Um, we have chapters in Canada. Um, we have chapters that are developing in Australia and Brazil. We've had chapters on the continent of Africa. Um, and then we have other um, kind of affiliates that we also work with. And we recognize that in struggling for black freedom, it does have to be a global movement. Um, and again, we are learning lessons. One of the things that we're grateful for is that we have, we don't have to start from scratch. We can learn lessons from movements that um, are, that, that moved ahead of us, right? And kind of laid foundations for us. Um, there's also a larger movement for black lives. So they don't, they're not black lives matter um, they're not part of the Black Lives Matter global network, but we do work in tandem. So organizations like the Dream Defenders, like um, BYP 100, right, are all part of the larger movement for Black Lives, part of this iteration of Black freedom struggle. Just like when you talk about the civil rights movement, you're not only talking about the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, you're talking about um, an assembly of organizations that sometimes move in concert. Sometimes one organization takes one piece of it and another organization takes another, but it's all about the liberation of black people. Our chapters are um, semi-autonomous, meaning that they get to choose their own focus. Um, but what binds us together is a set of guiding principles. And so, 
we all believe in the toppling of state sanctioned violence. We believe that um, when we talk about uh, public safety, it needs to be fundamentally reimagined. Um, we believe in investment in the things that actually create safe communities like housing and healthcare and good union jobs, right? Um, we believe in making sure that Black people get to live, that we're not just protesting Black death, but we're fighting for the right to full and complete and beautiful and joyful Black life. And um, that's kind of the work that we do. And as Reverend Lawson describes, um, we're also a multi-generational movement. So one of the things that I particularly love is that I'm in this movement with my children. Uh, my children are co-founders of the Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard, right? Um, and they have their own agenda. We had our, um, our we have a monthly general meeting um, every second, second Sunday and the Youth Vanguard has their own breakout session. And we always think sometimes as adults that we know what we're talking about. But the children came back from the Youth Vanguard meeting and they were like, um, students are going to college for the very first time. They don't know what they need. And so we need to be creating support systems for children who are coming out of a pandemic and stepping into a new place um, in terms of college and university. Um, so we need to make sure they have the um, uh, um, resources that they need. We need to make sure that they have the support systems that they need. And I think that that's just brilliant, right? So it's a multi-generational movement that includes children, that includes elders. Um, some of our core team members were involved in the civil rights movement. I think about people like Baba Akili, who was first trained by Cesar Chavez, um, who was active um, in the Black Power movement and remained active all of, he'll say, all of your life, right? <laughs> um, and so who remained active and is now one of our core organizers in Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, but also one of our key trainers in terms of onboarding new chapters and new activists. And then finally, when you ask about um, discipline, that is fundamental to what we do. We all, um, everyone is trained to operate under a principle that I call courageous discipline. So we want to be courageous. We want to confront systems. And we want to do so in a very disciplined way. So how do we harness our emotion, harness our power that comes with spirit, um, and then use it in a way that's strategic and disciplined so that we can um, make the most of our fight and be around to continue the fight. Black Lives Matter is almost eight years old now. And I think the way that we've been able to sustain ourselves is um, making sure that we adhere as much as we can to the principle of courageous discipline. Thank you, Professor Abdullah, for lifting up uh, the global dimension of Black Lives Matter, for lifting up the multi-generational aspect, uh, but also for lifting up the uh, sense of community building and the lifting up the joy and the love and the life uh, that has grown such a, a critical part of this movement. Um, and I and, wanted to ask- uh, Kent, let me, let me say something. Please. Um, one of the things I have noticed and recognized is Black Lives Matter has taken upon itself a deeply spiritual, moral, ethical strategy in this sense. Uh, they uh, have surrounded the fam every family where there's been a killing, uh, especially the families that have been in the news, and I'm sure many others outside the news uh, media, news media, they have surrounded that family with a loving, caring, grieving community. They have demonstrated and seems to me what in the New Testament is called good grief, <laughs> not getting sick from it, but rather 
talking about it and expressing it and building a family around the hurt family that therefore helps them to grieve publicly and join the struggle. I think that's one of the most powerful forms of ministry in a public movement. And it helps the grieving family not to become paralyzed by grief or paralyzed by conversation or paralyzed by inactivity, but to try to become a part of the struggle that will, in many cases, already has begun to produce change and to give the family new sense of tra personal transformation. So I don't know if Professor Abdul has considered that whole process, but they've turned the strategy, they've, they've, they've carried on a strategy of dealing with public grief, personal grief, that can be extremely useful for the healing of our nation. Absolutely. We've considered it, but not in way, not in the way that you've <laughs> articulated it. So I was hurriedly trying to write down everything that you were saying, Reverend Lawson. Um, mm -hmm. I think about a year into Black Lives Matter, I don't know why it took us so long, but um, one of the first things that we do when there's a killing um, by police is we go out and we form a prayer circle um, in the space where the life has been stolen. Mm -hmm. And usually it's, you know, within hours of that killing. And so sometimes we're literally standing on that blood. And um, it took us about a year. It was after the murder of Ezel Ford here in Los Angeles in August of 2014 to recognize that that is spiritual work. It's not just a social and racial justice movement, it's a spiritual movement. Exactly. And it requires that we have, that we shore ourselves up spiritually. Um, and I think that that's been hugely beneficial to ourselves. It's, you know, it sustains us, but it also allows us um, to recognize that we need to be that kind of support to the families for whom the grief is much more direct, right? The entire community yeah, is in yeah, mourning. Yeah. But the, the family is in a different kind of mourning. And so we're very clear that we can't be a social service organization, but we can recognize that by struggling um, on, sometimes on behalf of the family and when the family is ready, struggling alongside the family, that we're able to, um, some of the family members talk about turning their pain into power, right? And so encouraging them to do that and um, standing alongside them um, as they struggle for justice in the name of their loved ones. I wanted to build on that theme. Um... Professor Abdullah, because I do think that that's so powerful when you talk about this whole notion of turning grief into power. And I do think that uh, one thing that links uh, our work uh, involves lifting up the next generation and uh, inspiring and developing and encouraging uh, a new generation of activists. And I know that uh, through the 20 years that uh, Reverend Lawson and I have taught this class, we've seen uh, the transformation of extraordinary young people and students who uh, see the power of their voice and the power of their actions. And I've seen your work, uh, Professor Abdullah, uh, with the students that you have impacted and how that has had a transformational impact in uh, galvanizing more to get involved in uh, the movement for racial justice and social justice. Uh, so I, I'm interested in hearing more about uh, being rooted in the university and uh, mm -hmm. challenging some of the institutional racism that is within our universities, but also seeing the potential and power uh, as, as teachers. So um, would either of you like to comment mm -hmm. on that particular role? Uh, 
I'm happy to go first, but I'm eager to hear what Reverend Lawson has to share. Um, I'll just try to be brief about it, that um, I'm grateful to be a part again of a discipline that has a long history that was, you know, Black studies and ethnic studies more broadly is the only set of disciplines that actually comes out of community struggle. It doesn't come from the institution, right? And so I'm grateful to be a part of a discipline um, that recognizes that we have to be engaged in struggle, right? And so classroom space and that intellectual work that we do is really about developing intellectual tools and sharpening intellectual tools that are meant to transform this world, right? So um, the work that my students do, I'm teaching a class right now, it's a um, black power class um, and it's their field work class. So they have to identify a project, figure out their role um, within that project um, and determine how that's going to um, usher in greater freedom for Black people, right? Greater power for Black people. And so I'm grateful that that's what I get to teach. Um, I also recognize that um, even as a professor within the university, the university is an institution that was never set up to give us freedom. And so I'm grateful for the space. I'm grateful that I have, uh, I'm, I'm a unionized faculty member that earns a living wage, right? Um, I'm grateful to have some stability and some freedom in the sense that, you know, being, a faculty member really allows me to research, write, speak about whatever it is I'm passionate about, right? And that's um, a blessing. And the institution does not own me. I don't belong to the institution. And I think that there is, sometimes we have to remember that um, as institutions try to steer us in ways that um, are protective of the institution, we have to remember that we don't belong to the institution. So um, one of the things that we've been pushing as Black Lives Matter, but also um, through ethnic studies and through those of us who are committed to Black freedom struggle and understand that we belong to our people, we don't belong to the institution, is we need to decolonize the institutions that we teach in as well. So I was very fortunate to have co-authored a recent article with Robin Kelly from UCLA and Angela Davis um, around how we do that in California public universities, beginning with defunding the police on campus, beginning with talking about why we need to think about what abolition looks like at the UCs and CSUs and how we invest those public resources into providing support for our students into opening up the university, um, much like you're doing with this class, right? Making it accessible to everybody, right? Um, and then also how we use the university and use public universities in particular to be a complement to struggles that take place um, beyond the walls, beyond the um, ivory tower. Thank you, Professor Abdullah. And uh, uh, Reverend Lawson, you've taught for 20 years now at UCLA. You've taught at Vanderbilt University. You've taught at Cal State University Northridge. Um, but you've also continued your community education. You continue to run workshops and trainings on nonviolence throughout the country. So I was wondering if you might reflect on that particular role that you have played as an educator with regard to not only Black Lives Matter, but with regard to broader issues of economic and racial justice? Uh, well, Kent, I think it, it's important that uh, we recognize that struggle for truth and justice is an organic affair, cannot happen overnight. You cannot overthrow 400 year, year history of racism in the United States <laughs> in one generation. So we have a terrible responsibility, uh, awesome responsibility of making certain that we try to help young people 
especially black young people, wherever we are, in understanding that they have a role to continue the struggle. <laughs> they, they have an absolute role. They need, in order to do that, they need to know as much as possible about the struggle from the past and has it as and as it has impinged upon their lives, and as it has also called them to participate in it. Now, it's my contention, Professor Abdullah, that Black studies and women's studies come out of the movement of the 60s. It was in March of 1968 that students at Howard University in Washington, D.C., a Black institution, applied the sit-in techniques and philosophy to the university because they said the curriculum of the university does not really help us to live in our world, especially as black people. And so that began the first sit-in in in an administration building that quickly spread across the country. Columbia, Columbia University students challenged the curriculum of Columbia in September of 68. So fundamentally, the capacity of that movement then went on across the country, but it also went on in affecting how the university does its teaching. And I'm convinced that that's important. We, we have had in the United States a large, large group of people who want to continue to believe that the earth is flat. And so, for example, the Pew Studies uh, group a few years ago talked about the fact that in their studies, 67% of the people of the United States believed the earth was only about 6,000 years old. <laughs> um, 67%, they said, of the people of the United States would people who believe the earth is only about 6,000 years old. Well, that to me represents where uh, the, our acquisition of knowledge about ourselves as human beings, about our earth, um, about the universe itself, uh, 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 has not really gotten out to affect the way people think and how they see themselves and therefore how they see, see their universe. So the, the um, whole business of uh, uh, Latina studies, <laughs> as an example, is a consequence of the movement of the 19 mid-century, um, uh, uh, in the mid-century of the 20th century and all. So it is important also, it seems to me, for us to acknowledge the extent to which, therefore, and there has been an unstudied, no, there have been a, a major facet of the movement of the 20th century, 20th century has not been researched and examined. And that is the many student groups that across the nation organized to reshape the way in which curriculum is done at the university higher education level and how courses are taught. I don't know of any single book that has collected that massive affair, uh, which in some ways reached its climax even in the 1970-1972, again, students leaving away with some counselors from the university, some faculty people in the university joining with them and helping to become their teachers and their counselors on how to do it. But uh, uh, that movement may have been the first major movement at the level of higher education that said the university must deliberately get itself involved in the emancipation of the people of the United States. And, and to do this specifically through the, through the curriculum. 
So I'm, I'm delighted to hear what you're telling us, uh, Melina Abdullah, about this. This is uh, very, very important. Um, uh, and and we and we need it very desperately across the nation. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, for the record, uh, this class that we've been teaching for 20 years has been both a labor studies class, an African American studies class, yes. and a Chicano yeah. studies and Central American right. studies. Exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, from, right. its, from its inception, <laughs> there was a deliberate uh, yeah. alliance between ethnic studies and labor studies at UCLA and to advance the understanding of nonviolence and social movements, not as an academic discipline, but as something that can actually provide guidance and inspiration and encouragement for uh, our students to uh, not only learn about the world around them, but to indeed change the world around them. Um, mm -hmm. But on that issue, uh, Professor Abdul, I wonder if you could reflect on uh, the uh, struggle to advance and to expand ethnic studies uh, to challenge uh, the Eurocentric focus of so many uh, institutions of higher learning across the country uh, and how that fits in to the broader movement for black lives. Sure, well, I, I wanna thank Reverend Lawson for lifting up an example from Howard University, my alma mater. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm grateful that you <laughs> lifted that up. Any chance I have to say that I come, that I'm a bison, I, I celebrate that. My daughter is now one of those first year students who's taking all of her classes online, um, also at Howard University and majoring in African-American studies there under um, the phenomenal Dr. Greg Carr, um, who leads that department. I think as we talk about ethnic studies, um, there, is, there are so many linkages between black freedom struggle and Black studies in particular and ethnic studies more broadly, right? So when we think about the birth of ethnic studies, and I loved um, the example of 1968 at Howard, and then we also need to think about 1968 at San Francisco State, right? And so how the student movement at San Francisco State birthed ethnic studies. It was a student demand. It was a community demand. It was, um, again, as Reverend Lawson was sharing, supported by some radical faculty members. We can think about the role of people like Sonia Sanchez and Amiri Baraka and others in making sure that we won Black studies. And we also have to remember that, you know, a liberatory model of education was point number five on the Black Panther Party um, 10 point platform. And so, it was a community struggle. And so when we think about um, Black studies and Pan-African studies and ethnic studies, it's always been about that. It's always been about liberation. And it's important that we recognize what Black studies is. So many people think that black studies and ethnic studies is about correcting the record. And it absolutely is. It's absolutely about saying Columbus didn't discover America and Lincoln didn't free the slaves, right? It's absolutely about lifting up people like Joanne Robinson and Septima Clark and Reverend Lawson and you know, thinking about what the power of black organizers and organizers of color and um, you know, women um, of color had to do with moving us to where we are now and uh, our capacity for, as Robin Kelly would say, freedom dreaming, and then ushering those dreams into reality. It's absolutely about filling those voids. And for me now, see, this is how you know I'm getting old because I'm about to tell you a story. For me, um, Black studies saved my life. Right, so I was born in the 1970s in Oakland, California, came of age in the 90s and um, began to come of age just as crack cocaine was also hitting my neighborhood in East Oakland. And my mother who was a single mom, elementary school teacher had the foresight to recognize I could not go to the Oakland school that I was assigned to. I needed to go to a different school. 
so that I could get a better education, but also so that I could be safer, right? So systems were set up in such a way that two rival neighborhoods went to the same high school and it resulted in tremendous violence at that high school, Fremont High School. So I wound up going to Berkeley High School, which was the only high school in the country with a black studies department. And so as I was pulled by, you know, my neighborhood and, you know, I did some things, right? I often say I was arrested six times. I've been arrested six times for protesting. <laughs> I won't say uh, the other things that are, you know, less noble, right? But um, I was caught up in some things, but it was really Black studies at Berkeley High School under Richard Navies that planted some seeds and enabled me to step into myself and my fullest potential. And it, he did that, Black studies at Berkeley High School did that for generations of students. And so I recognize Black studies and ethnic studies as being not just an intellectual pursuit, but uh, it's part of Black freedom struggle. So it's about correcting records, but it's also about recognizing that when my students come into the classroom, they come in with a base of knowledge already. They come in with wisdom from their grandmothers and their mothers. They come in with experiences. They come in with a knowledge that comes from growing up in particular ways that force them, challenge them to kind of step into these wisdoms that are often unrecognized. And so we have a pedagogy that's different. We have an epistemological practice that says that we are not just studying to study, we are studying and developing research that can be, again, an intellectual tool in larger liberation struggle. And then the last thing that I'll say, and then I'll be quiet, is that it's also the reason that part of Black freedom struggle includes advancing ethnic studies. So just recently, um, we passed AB 1460, which was an ethnic studies requirement in the Cal State system, brilliantly and courageously authored by our now um, Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, who's the former chair of Africana Studies at San Diego State University, and at the time was a member of the state assembly. And it makes it a requirement that every single student in every single Cal State um, University campus has to take an ethnic studies class. In 2014, we made it a requirement that students out of LAUSD have to take ethnic studies classes. And we're looking at how to implement that statewide in the state of California. And that's also a part of freedom struggle, right? Taking ethnic studies, disrupting what can sometimes be an oppressive pedagogy of the oppressed, right? An oppressive, um, educational process is also part of liberation struggle. Well, thank you so oh, much. Can't... Yes, I, I was uh, just going to thank uh, Professor Abdullah so much for joining us today. Uh, she has to uh, jump off in a couple minutes, but I was going to give you uh, the last word, uh, Reverend Lawson, to uh, wind up uh, this uh, class session. Well, I, I usually speak about the movements having a two-point business. We have to dismantle the old that has been a torturous path for too many millions of people in the United States and around the world. We have to dismantle the ideologies that have helped to cause the wrong, which requires good education and good study and research. And then in dismantling things in my mind, and I really learned this from the movement in, you know, in the 20th century, because I discovered that the word that I heard often from various civil rights people and organizations, integration was inadequate. It did not, it did not do what we were saying in Nashville or in Birmingham in 60, 58 and 61, because the systems of wrong have, must be dismantled so that then people have the chance to put in place new systems where truth and justice are dominant. 
they can then have the they have the space and the time to experiment with new ways of our living together. So uh, I maintain that we haven't passed yet the stage of dismantling the injustice and the cruelty that that, that the university has to help lead the way and make that happen. Before so we go, I just want to say how grateful I am to have shared this space with you, Reverend Lawson. You always um, really just give me um, such inspiration and just so many, you plant so many seeds and you kind of encourage me down a road. And I'm just very, very grateful for your example, for your encouragement for all of the wisdom that I'm trying to type in my phone so I won't forget the brilliant words that you're speaking. Um, so I'm just very grateful to have shared this space. Thank you for inviting me to your class. And thank you, Brother Kent, also for having me and for facilitating this conversation. I'm grateful you. for your being with us, uh, Melina Abdullah. And also, I'm personally quite grateful for the fact that you have, across the years, joined the great visible, invisible community of those of us who know that we seek a country that does not yet exist. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that concludes our class. Please join us again next week. Take care. <laughs>